mainstream reality. For example, if you read 18th and 19th century literature, which I like to read on occasion, there will always be a lot of class struggle and emotional unfulfillment. Like Jane Austen. <laughs> The characters are mostly dissatisfied and feel victimized by society. But there is little if no mention about the real slaves of the system. The horses that are harnessed to the carriages, pulling human beings to this party or that. Or the cows tied up in the back alleys of tenement buildings, anemic producing blue-tinged milk. The other animals only appear as extras, insignificant to the important stories that have been being enacted between human beings. Recently, a yoga student gave me a book, Cloud Atlas. Have you read that book? Anyone? Who has read it? Anyone? Oh my god, one person. <laughs> All right. It's a work of fiction, a novel. Some might call it a sci-fi thriller. It explores the concepts of karma and reincarnation. And I've heard that the makers of the movie The Matrix have also made Cloud Atlas into a film now. So as I was reading this book, Cloud Atlas, I reflected back when I was growing up in the 1950s. And the hot movies at that time were films like war movies, Bridge Over the River Kwai, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Godzilla, the Martian invasion. There's a scene I will never forget from The Incredible Shrinking Man, where the hero of the story has been shrunk down to just a mere half inch tall, and has become marooned in his own basement. And he has to battle a giant spider. And he finds a sewing needle. And with the sewing needle, he he kills the spider. Films like these reveal a deep mistrust of nature and a feeling of human fragility against nature and other animals, and the need to annihilate and conquer rather than communicate, work together, and get along. The concept is us against them. It is inconceivable that films like The Matrix or Cloud Atlas would have been accepted and understood if released in the 1950s. It would have just been over people's heads. In this regard, I would say we're really making progress. As the message is no longer us against them. Concepts like shunita, emptiness, have leaked into mass media putting the cause of the problems on the individual, not on the faceless other. Exposing corporations for what they are, amplified personifications of the greed and boredom which arise out of ourselves. And who are we but the consumer masses of humanity suffering from an extrinsic, extrinsic self, low self-esteem, an ignorance of who we really are. Sri Brahmananda taught that yoga is that state where you are missing nothing, where you feel whole and complete. Are we getting to that? Are we getting closer to that? Are we getting closer to that yoga? Recently, I posted a positive story on my Facebook page about the progress being made by animal rights organizations in stopping circuses from exploiting elephants. A comment appeared asking me, why do I care so much about animal abuse? What about all the human abuse? I care about animal abuse because we are all animals. And I choose not to be locked in to the prejudicial system that differentiates this animal as more worthy than that animal. Human beings are animals too. It's a biological fact. <laughs> As my holy teacher Swami Ramalananda said, the speaking and choosing who to love promotes schisms and prejudices 
and causes us to feel separate from all of life. Why not be more cosmopolitan <laughs> and feel ourselves, as Swami Nirmalananda would say, as a citizen of the cosmos, a friend to all. We all want to be successful. Yoga teaches that success comes to the one who is friendly and kind towards others. For this yoga to happen, for us to experience freedom from the need to consume material products and exploit the earth and other animals, for us to experience the joy of needing nothing, of feeling whole and complete, we must explore kindness our own capacity for kindness, and not stay tight and miserly, only dealing our kindnesses out to those we like or those who will give us something in return. When we begin to allow our kindness to be limitless, we begin to understand our potential for being the limitless beings that we really are. This is truly the great adventure to break the self-centered chains that bind our hearts and begin to see the other as our own self. <coughs> and with this dawning of a new year, we have been given the opportunity to explore this potential. Thank you for listening to my New Year's message.
And then I, always, I have uh, our uh, compost from yesterday. And those have to be dumped outside. And so every day I walk outside and I put the compost in the compost heap. Didn't make a lot of sense on the last day because I was going to be compost in a minute. You know what I mean? It, I mean, cleaning the kitty litter, what's that about? There is no tomorrow. <laughs> um, but the cats appreciated it. But anyway, I got outside and I have to walk the same path about, you know, from here to the doorway, from the compost to where we dump the kitty litter out. And I walk that path every day, every morning that I'm, I'm home. And through different seasons, I walk that path. Now, from where I'm standing to the doorway, there's a path that you could call the ideal path. And, and it's a straight line through there, you know? But if I, I want to get to the doorway, and I, I have this ideal path in mind, the first thing I do is I, I find an obstacle that I have to take a slight diversion around and through, and eventually I'll, I'll, I'll get a path all the way to the doorway, but it won't be a straight line. It'll be a path, you could call it the path of least resistance. You know, you could call it even a, a path of discovery, as I, as I find my way through. And each day the path changes a little bit. You know, one day you arrive and there's a, a wildflower that's grown up there. And you used to walk there, but then you started to walk around the wildflower. And you walked around enough time so that became the new path. And one day you come out and, and it's raining a lot. And so there's a wet spot, a muddy spot. And so you have to walk on the very edge of your path. And the path becomes a little bit wider just at that point. And then recently there's ice and there's snow, so I walk out, and the path isn't on a flat, it's on a hill. So I have to compensate because I'm, uh, it's slippery and I might slide a little bit, so the path changes a little bit more to take into consideration this uh, treacherous terrain. During the summer the grass grew up and my path became quite easy to see. Not a straight path, but an unusually shaped path. A path shaped almost as differently, as almost as distinctively as, as my own signature. And then the snow came and covered the path over. But you could still see a little bit where the path was because the snow dropped down into that place where the grass was lowest. And so that was a new way, a, a, a kind of rediscovery of the path, a redelineating of the path. But on the last day, when it dawned on me that it's the, uh, the actions that we repeat over and over again in our daily lives that make our world, that it's, it's the repetition of, of energy moving through space in a specific trajectory, in a, in a specific signature that causes all this to come into being. The repetition over and over brings it into being, just like my path, each day over and over. And it arose organically and spontaneously and, and magically in a way. And on the last day I looked at that path, maybe a little bit like how you looked at, at uh, your life tonight. Maybe you reflected on your life, maybe you just reflected on the last year. And maybe you could distinguish your own path as you look back over that trail that you followed here. And uh, you saw the specialness of it, the uniqueness of it, different than anybody else's path. 
And I think that that's a good thing to do on the last day. Now, you know, in 2006, our friend Daniel Pinchback wrote this book, 2012, The Return of Quasicodal. And uh, Daniel talked in that book about the end of the Mayan calendar, meaning the end of times. And he, and he gave a, a great presentation in the, in the cafe here, and afterward there were questions and answers. And so one of the people in the audience raised their hand and said, uh, Mr. Pinchback, okay, let's say it's December 22nd, 2012, and everything is the same, nothing happened. What are you going to say then? <laughs> and he said, well, that's just not possible. <laughs> that on December 22nd, things are going to be the same as they are now. Just like in your lives, tomorrow is not going to be the same as it was today. It's a whole new day, a whole new year, Hold it back.